Hi everybody, welcome back. Well, nothing makes me happier than when I post a video and I get a lot of good comments and a lot of questions and things like that. And some things I learn from and some things you learn from and some things we need to learn more about. So that got me to thinking maybe I should post a, just a short uh, follow-up video to the series that we did on the protection circuit for the speaker protects these little boards that we built this is the bigger one that we have not done maybe we'll do this one in a future project but one of the things that came up a few times was the idea of putting two electrolytic polarized capacitors in reverse polarity like this and using them as an AC capacitor now, I think there was a little bit of questions that, that were asked, and one of the biggest ones that came up a couple of times was, you know, isn't the capacitor one of them always going to be in reverse bias? And if that is the case, if the reverse polarity is on it, will it not damage it? And do you not need a set of diodes facing the opposite direction uh, to prevent that? The answer is no, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, the other thing I, one person commented on was that you should not connect the negatives together, but rather the positives. They went into a great detail uh, as to why. But I don't, I can't, didn't do a lot of research, but what I will tell you is everyone in the past that I have ever talked to that has done this over the years, a lot of the old gray beards and things that are a lot smarter than me, have always told me to wire the negatives together. And even if you do just a little bit of searching online, you'll see in most cases people connect the negatives together. Now, the other question was, you know, I hear a lot of explanations, you know, or read a lot online when I kind of look this stuff up. And a lot of people say that the capacitor, one capacitor handles the positive uh, half cycle and the other handles the negative half cycle and that's not entirely true. Let's take a look uh, what what this does when we put AC on it okay and before we do that let's take some measurements of these capacitors. Okay I have the LCR analyzer on and let's start by connecting it to just one of the capacitors. And we can just pick one randomly as the leads pop off. And you can see that this is a 470 microfarad cap, and these are very old capacitors. They're new old stock. They've been sitting in a bin for a long time. But you can see it's reading about 417 microfarads at 120 hertz. And the ESR is 0.3 ohms, or 3 mil 3, 300 milli ohms. And if I measure the other capacitor, should be similar. And it's about the same, 416 microfarads, and again, 0.3 ESR. Now if I take and measure across both of them, and they're wired back to back with the negatives together, you can see that the value cuts in half. So instead of a 400 microfarad capacitor, you now have a 200 microfarad capacitor. And also, the ESR doubles. Now this is, this is one of the negatives uh, that you have, you know, one of the caveats, when you use two electrolytic capacitors back to back. Their ESRs will add up. That could be a problem if you're putting a lot of current through them, or if you're running them at high frequency that ESR is actually going to cause heat in the capacitors. So you can have a warmed up capacitor <laughs> when you use them in this manner with a lot of current. But if you're using these to just pass a signal, like in an audio path or something, it's usually not a huge problem, although I try to avoid electrolytic capacitors altogether if I need a non-polarized cap. Now, let's look at something else. Now right here I have a brand new capacitor and this is a spare one that I keep for my air conditioning compressor for the house. 
uh, for the blower motor. It's the one of the AC motor capacitors. And you can see it is an AC capacitor. So it's five microfarads at 370 or 440 volts AC. So it's designed for mains power. And when you look at it, it's got a metal case on it. And it says it's oil protected, but really what's inside of here in some in a lot of these is any of these that are elect act electrolytic will have two capacitors back to back inside of them. Now you can also have you know a uh, paper in oil capacitor which this one might be because it says castor oil protected and notice how large it is but it also can have two separate capacitors in there and this one kind of looks like it's the two electrolytics see how it's kind of curved here and curved here kind of rounded out there's actually two rolls in here and they're probably two 10 microfarad capacitors. Now we can measure them and if it has a fa fairly high ESR then it pretty much tells us let's see what it says. So you can see this one's 4.9 microfarad so it's pretty close. You can see the ESR is pretty low between 0.1 and 0.2 so this is probably an oil capacitor but a lot of these are not oil. They're actually two electrolytics that are back to back. Same thing with uh, bipolar capacitors. When you get the bipolar electrolytics, there's actually, the, they, the way they layer them, they're layered in such a way that it's basically two capacitors wired back to back, two polarized ones. So that should give you an idea of how these work and that actually it's a real thing. You can do it and it works. The only thing you'll notice, like I said, is if you put a lot of uh, current through these or whatever, they will heat up because, again, unless they're super low ESR capacitors, the ESRs will add up so you'll have double the ESR or equivalent series resistance. I'm sorry if I didn't say that earlier what that means. We've talked about that in other videos. But anyway, anyway, let's connect this up and see what the waveforms look like on it. Okay, so here's our little test setup. If you notice, I have two channels of my oscilloscope connected to either end of the capacitor. And the center, where the two caps are tied together, I have the commons connected on there. Okay? And if you notice, there is a white and red wire jumper lead. And that goes over to this little tiny transformer, and there's 9 volts AC on the secondary of this transformer. So when I turn this on, it's going to apply between 9 and 10 volts AC. Remember, this is unloaded, so it's probably be closer to 10 volts AC across these terminals. Now you know, with a normal electrolytic capacitor, what's going to happen is the capacitor is going to heat up <laughs> and explode <laughs> because when it goes in reverse bias it's going to act like a dead short. But that's not what we're going to see in this. What do you think the waveform is going to look like? Think about it for a second and then we'll move the move up to the scope and we'll look. Okay, hi everybody. <laughs> yeah, the mirrorized scope display. All right, so we're going to turn this on, and we're going to have a yellow and a blue trace. And the yellow trace and the blue trace represent the two oscilloscope probes. The red trace is a math uh, trace, and it is the difference between the two signals between the two probes at any given time. So what you're looking at is each capacitor with reference to the common point there between them and then you're going to see the red trace is going to be the actual difference at any given time uh, between them okay between the outside terminals so here we go and take a look at that <laughs> 
So what are we seeing? Well, you're seeing the blue trace is one capacitor, what's happening with it, and the other one, yellow trace, is the other capacitor. And you can see they're 180 degrees out of phase from one another. And when you look at the difference between these two, or the, the where they are, you can see they kind of, that this whole peak adds together as one big peak and it becomes this. So if you look at the RMS for each side is about half, or you know, we have a nine volt signal on there and you see that there's 4.53 volts RMS. And if we look, and because we're at five volts per division with our scope and the red trace is five volts per division and you can see five, 10, so it's just a little bit over than that. If you look at the RMS value, you'll see it comes out to about nine volts. Okay, does that make sense? So neither, neither capacitor is seeing the entire voltage, does, if that makes sense. I know that sounds confusing. And therefore, when you hear that, when you put two capacitors in series like this, they actually can handle double the voltage. So if these are 25 volt capacitors, for instance. So they actually can handle 50 volts in total across them because at any given time, both capacitors are only going to have half of the total waveform presented across them. And you can see that in the waveform here. And look, the scales are the same. Once again, five volts per division, with the yellow trace, five volts per division for the blue trace, and five volts per division for the red trace. And you can see the red trace is just about double uh, the other traces. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Now, if I look down at the capacitors again, here they are. And if I touch them, they're just, they're about room temperature maybe a little bit above and if I let this sit here long enough they will they will begin to feel very slightly warm to the touch they won't get hot but they'll just be because of that ESR they'll get the least tiniest little bit warm and that's why this is really not a good thing to do uh, in a circuit that's going to have a lot of power or a lot of current uh, being drawn through it this is really a good thing if you just want to pass a signal through it in both directions that's not high current. So they're just an idea, just to give you an idea of how back-to-back -back capacitors can become a non-polarized capacitor like that. And that's how it works. Now one viewer brought up something that was extraordinarily important and I touched on it but I don't think I went into detail and I don't think I stressed it nearly enough and I really thank him for this. I thanked him in the comments because this is something that's very important that I really kind of missed with you guys. And that is any of these kits that you see like this, they have to have their own power supply. If you know what you're doing in the right circumstances, if you have the correct DC voltage in your amplifier, you could probably pick off of that voltage like I did with that little buck boost or that little buck regulator and power it that way. But in most cases, if you're, use, if you're using an AC signal, you're going to use the AC input with that little bridge rectifier that we had in there, you cannot put it across a, a winding on your transformer that already has a bridge rectifier on it. You can't put two bridge rectifiers in parallel with one another. You can have a lot of problems when you do that. It has to be independent. So keep that in mind. You really need to look at the power supply uh, before you try to connect this up. And if you don't have a separate one, you're either going to have to use a separate transformer or you could possibly use a capacitive dropper from, from the AC mains coming in. I don't like doing that. It's kind of sketchy when you use those, but technically you could do it. Um, and make sure that it's isolated, you know, from, don't, put, don't put this as it sits and this as it sits with, its, with the bridge rectifiers. Do not put them 
in parallel with another bridge rectifier. Bad idea. The other thing is I got a comment, well, why didn't I just connect uh, this little module directly to my, you know, my the power rail of the of the amplifier because it was somewhere around 33 34 volts well number one these can handle these little voltage regulators if I did that they can handle around 35 volts and I was getting right to the edge of that 35 volt range so this would be operating near its designed maximum that's a problem that I don't ever like to do it's just a thing I don't do you can do it it'll probably work but this is not something I typically do I always like things to have headroom the other thing is even if it did work with no problem the more voltage you have to drop through this regulator the more heat it has to produce because that's that's how it drops the voltage it converts the voltage you're not using into heat the rest of the voltage passes to the to the device you're, you're trying to power so if if I put 14 volts into a 12 volt regulator this is only dropping 2 volts and conversely the amount of wattage that dependent upon how much current is flowing through it at 2 volts so usually it's a small amount of power that it's dissipating whereas if I'm dropping from 35 volts to 12 volts that's an awful lot of power and at, at whatever current it's drawing it's a lot more wattage than if you're only dropping a couple of volts so again this thing runs really warm and that's why these have heat sink tabs and if you notice this doesn't have a provision for a heat sink so this would be running a lot warmer than I would be comfortable with that's why I didn't do that and that's why I use the little buck regulator um, but you can do it however you want just understand that and last but not least I had a uh, question about well it really wasn't a question it was a comment and a warning and this was the big one that I really have to, to talk about and that is you can only use these kits this one and this one in an amplifier that shares a common ground between both left and right speaker channels now a lot of your class A B amplifiers a lot of your little class A amps or the capacitor decoupled ones from the 1970s and things those all use ground the, the actual chassis ground power supply ground as the return path for your speaker terminals for both channels and on all of these modules the negative terminal of the speaker is tied to ground so they're all the negatives are tied to one another and then the negatives that are tied together are tied to ground now some amplifiers will either have an isolated negative or they will have a separate negative and positive which is still isolated <laughs> I guess um, from the right and the left if you connect that type of like a lot of those carver amplifiers or a lot of the amplifiers that have that that can be uh, run in in uh, bridged mono mode they actually have like a, a f either a reversed polarity on one channel or they have totally isolated grounds and if you connect them to this you will short the amplifier out you will damage your amplifier you cannot use that on this now these circuits could be modified to work like that you would need a different type of relay in the first place you would need to have a you know two double pole double throws relays and those relays would have to be completely the contacts would have to be isolated from ground and from one another so the rest of the circuit would probably work but those relays the way those contacts are wired would have to be different and you would have to pretty much remove these relays from these boards use external relays and make sure that they're connected so that you know they switch the positive and negative for the left and the positive and negative to the right switch on and off independently if that makes sense all right I did not mention that in the video and I should have that should have been the very first thing when these videos started that I mentioned so that's it uh, those were just a couple things I wanted to just quickly follow up on and again I hope you enjoyed it I wish you all peace joy happiness and good health in your lives
and I will be back real soon because I have a lot of projects that I want to get get working on and I think we're going to build a project for the next one. We'll see though. Talk to you again. Take care. Bye-bye.